welcome to More Christ. Today I'm joined by the marvellous Dr. J. Richard Middleton. J. Richard is Professor of Biblical Worldview and Exegesis at Northeastern Seminary in New York State in the USA, and he's a junk professor of Old Testament at the Caribbean Graduate School of Theology in Kingston, Jamaica. So just to begin then, Richard, can you please tell us a little bit about your background and some of the key events in your life that have helped to form you and your love for Christ and his church? Well, I guess, the, let me mention three of many that you could, because as you get older, you see more and more in the pattern, right? So I've got to be selective here. So the very first thing is, when I was a kid, maybe nine years old, my dad sat me down on a rock in our backyard and told me about what Jesus did for me. And that was the beginning of my journey to embrace Christ. And um, I didn't get involved in the church for a few years, not until I was a teenager. So the, the next big shift for me was, getting involved in the church as, as a young teenager starting theological studies as an undergraduate and finding a real grounding in scripture that grounded my entire life. And for me, that was a grounding of scripture's holistic vision that God loves the world and wants to redeem the world. And this was the big theological idea that affected me um, in, in my 20s. Later on, um, in my 30s, I went through a kind of a vocational crisis where I went through a time of darkness. And that brought me back to the Psalms of Lament, where I could pray my heart out to God. And I came to a deeper understanding of God's love for us in a time of brokenness, even when we have nothing left but God to hang on to. So for me, there was this initial faith experience, then a sense of the, the love of God for all the world, and then a love of God for me in my depths, the suffering of God. And that, those are the transformative experiences that have guided my life as a Christian. The primary ones, anyway. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing there, Richard. And um, then you mentioned your father. There Are there any other persons who've been especially inspirational or influential in your life? Yeah, so uh, when I was a teenager, the pastor at my church, I remember David Bieberstein. This is my church in Jamaica where I grew up, but he's, he's retired now in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and he affected me pretty profoundly, uh, mentoring me and um, teaching me scripture. And he was an adjunct professor at my undergraduate seminary. He taught me some courses and um, he's very influential in my life. Um, but there have been others who've been influential, but not so much personally, but through their writings. Um, particularly, I'd say in Old Testament studies, Walter Brueggemann has been primarily influential for me in understanding the scripture. And then also um, N.T. Wright in New Testament studies. And I've become somewhat friends with both of them. A little closer to Wright than to Brueggemann, but still, um, those are the people who have affected me deeply um, and have helped my aspirations to want to understand scripture better and to be a better Christian. Fantastic. And um, I'd love to look at some of your wonderful written work today, which is how I grew to know you. And um, I'd love to start with uh, a new heaven and a new earth, actually reclaiming biblical eschatology. First, then, uh, if I might ask you, what's wrong with the traditional Christian view, which is not really traditional, of heaven as our final destiny? And what are some of the historical origins of that kind of otherworldly idea? Right, right. So the, the, you have two fundamentally different paradigms about the destiny of the world and the destiny of the human being. One is that our purpose is to ascend from earth to heaven. And this involves an assumption that earth is transitory, it is not as important, and there is a, an immaterial realm, which is God's realm, and we're supposed to ascend to God. And this is a, a paradigm which we get primarily from Neoplatonism, um, the, the, the reframing of Plato in the early part of the Christian centuries uh, by Plotinus, the philosopher. And this was a, a lot of Christians you know, found this appealing as a way to use a framework to think about God and Christianity in relation to the, the Greco-Roman culture of the time. But the biblical vision is different. It's incarnational. God comes from heaven into our experience. God comes you know, in the, in the Exodus. I come down to deliver my people. And he comes down to dwell with them in the tabernacle and to guide them with a pillar of fire and cloud. And God is present to people in historical circumstances. And the New Testament says, well, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we see his glory, but it's the glory of a human being, God with us. And this whole paradigm that heaven will come to earth, God will come to be with us to transform earthly existence is in tension with the ascent paradigm. And the problem with the ascent paradigm, it's, it's hard to know what's the chicken and what's the egg, right? But one of the effects of this paradigm of that we are going to heaven as eschatology is that we care very little for the earth. We don't care for 
ecological issues. We don't care for social justice because everything's going to be destroyed and we go somewhere else. Now, I've had a student just yesterday in class suggest that was the rationale for people buying into that vision because they didn't want to have to care for the world. So what's the chicken and the egg was the question. Which one is the result and which one is you know, the cause? I don't know. But the vision that um, we are, that God is coming to us in our earthly existence makes this world important for our lives today. And a quote I've been using a lot, I put it in the book, New Heaven and New Earth, which is now seven years old. It seems old to me now, right? <laughs> is ethics is lived eschatology. That is, whatever you actually yearn for and expect as the destiny of the world, you would begin to live that out now. Have I answered the question enough or you want to press a little bit more? No, that's brilliant. Thank you, Richard. And um, what are some of the main contours then of this overarching story that the Bible is telling us, say, about how we're to enjoy our creative work and culture, as you sort of say, caring for the environment and so on, rather than worship in the more um, conventional sense, again, which is developed. So, so what you're getting at is I do a little bit of a polemic in the book, um, say that we weren't created to worship God, which I'm not saying you shouldn't worship God, that's not my point. But if you look at all the creation texts in the Bible, we are created with a missional vocation that's earth-oriented, not God-oriented. It's from God through us to the world. We are given dominion in the world. We are asked to represent God as God's image in the world. Um, and so the biblical story is a story of God bringing the world into being, giving human beings as his emissaries or representatives, imago, they, the image of God. And we, with that um, awesome responsibility and power, have destroyed the world and destroyed human life. And by our sin or our transgression of God's boundaries, we transgress each other's boundaries. We bring violence into the world. And God has been a, a planning to bring redemption to this world. But he doesn't bring redemption like, you know, zapping from heaven, like Zeus with lightning bolts. He comes into the world and he works through the people of Israel that he has called, his elect people. And when they mess up, he brings the Messiah, who's a representative of Israel. And the Messiah calls together a group of people. And these people go out into the world to bring blessings through the, the gospel. And the church keeps messing up, but God's spirit is working with us until the end of the age when he returns to make a new heaven and a new earth. So that's basically the contours as I look at it, that God, God wants to, to put it this way, um, there's a saying in some churches that God doesn't make junk. And that's to say, value yourself. You're not an unimportant person. God doesn't make junk. But one of my professors said, yeah, you also got to say God doesn't junk what he makes. <laughs> so if God creates the world and God so loved the world, says the Gospel of John, it means God's going to redeem the world. Now, he will not redeem everybody in the world unless you get with the program. That's why the kingdom is coming repent and believe. You have to embrace that kingdom and want transformation to be part of that cosmic transformation that's coming. Mm, I mean, and um, then Richard, something that I think is difficult in this day and age is to bear witness when it comes to the, the way the Bible describes sin. People think they're basically good. Maybe they have this Rousseauian notion. The societal structures are bad, but I'm good. And you, you can see it even built into the language. So I'm just wondering if you could tell us a bit more about how this lines up, say, God's original intent for humans in the context of the good world and how that's been impeded by sin. And then uh, how has this blocked God's original intent for flourishing of this earthly life then? I think you just summarized it perfectly. I don't need to say much more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, I want to emphasize that this, this holistic vision that God wants to redeem the world does not mean that God is unconcerned about the individual and your heart and your internal interior experience. And that's why I said, you know, the kingdom is coming, but you must repent and believe. That's what Jesus says, right? Mm -hmm. So the... the the description of sin in the flood story in Genesis 6 is that God saw that every inclination of the human heart was always evil all the time. But it also said that he looked at the world and he saw that the world was corrupt because it was filled with violence. So there is both the internal and there is the external. There is a, you know, the, the evil in the world does not just come about because the structures of the world are evil. It comes about because we develop the structures of the world as people with our own selfish intent. And we, and I'm not affirming that we are just individuals. We are also communal beings. And there are real structures, social structures that exist in the world, but we have developed them 
And like anything that human beings touch, it's gonna to be good in it and it's gonna be bad in it because we mess up, but not everything is totally bad. So in our contemporary secular world, maybe, maybe a lot of people think that I'm really good and it's a world that's bad, but I was raised in a church which said that you're really bad. And, and the definition of to be human is you're a sinner. But I wanna say that before you're a sinner, you've been created good, made in the image of God. And the world is, God looked at the world and saw that it was very good. It's now become dis disrupted and corrupted but it's the corruption is a corruption of something that's fundamentally good. So even in my individual life, as I make all kinds of bad decisions on a regular basis and mess up relationships and my decisions reverberate and affect other people negatively. And look, everybody is in that situation. There's nobody exempt. Nevertheless, that disruption and corruption is a corruption of my identity, which is good. God made me to be his representative in the world as his image. And that is never taken away. I can image God badly. I can distort the image of God in the way I live. But there's something underneath the distortions that's still good. And that's what's redeemable. God can refurbish that old um, piece of furniture that's been totally scarred and destroyed. God can sand it down and put on a new coat of varnish on it. And it's going to look beautiful again. It can be renewed because there's something that's good there despite the destruction. Hmm. my narrative analysis of sin right there <laughs> yeah brilliant thank you richard and um then again another stereotype and cliche is that the the god of the old testament is this awful um angry father and so on and he's just mistreating these uh, vulnerable human beings or something as if they're all innocent but um i think you show a much more interested and complex picture of this holistic salvation as it pertains to the old testament as much as the new the new and um i'm asking you just maybe touch on some of those points and uh, how the old testament uncovers some ways in which a uh, we might understand god's ongoing commitment to our flourishing in this life and the next i guess the first thing to say about this is <clears throat> You cannot read the New Testament accurately if you don't understand the Old, because the Old Testament was the only scripture of Jesus and the early church. It's the only scripture Paul knew, for example. So they are reading um, the life of Jesus and the life of the church through the lens of the Old Testament. And so there is a, a wonderful book by Brent Strong called The Old Testament is Dying, which basically says that we've lost our ability to speak Old Testament as a language. We don't understand the language. We speak a pigeon version. You know, you call me go there. You have, we have a simplistic understanding of the Old Testament. God is angry. God is judgmental. And then we have New Testament. And we think that that's a different language. It's the same language. And we're losing the religious language of faith if we don't understand the Old Testament. So there's a, so much that's involved in the Old Testament that's complex, as you say. And when you're going to, when you interview Shai Held on this, he will talk about this. We have a similar view on this point. The core revelation of God in the Old Testament is at Exodus 34. The Lord, the Lord, a God gracious and compassionate, that overflowing with love and, and forgiveness for thousands. This is, the, this is the God of the Old Testament. Of course, there is judgment. Of course, God gets angry. But anger, I mean, any description of God is, quote, unquote, anthropomorphic. Any description, there, even the most transcendent description is used as language that we refer to created things with and refer to God that way. So, of course, you get angry. When, when do you actually get angry? When you care about something so much, but it hurts you, then you're angry. If you don't care, just you're whatever, who, who gives, you know? So God's anger is an aspect of God's caring that we have so abused each other and the world and abused God. But anger is not the primary characteristic of God. It is, a, it is an effect of God's love. That's the primary characteristic. Now, it would take a lot of time to go through all the multiple examples in both old and New Testament about God's anger and judgment, because they're in both Testaments. And you just you read the New Testament with open eyes, you'll see it there too. But they're all facets of this unbreakable commitment of God to the world. God is not some transcendent deity that is untouched by reality. God has opened himself up to be affected by us. And so God is in a genuine relationship. In any genuine relationship, anger is a part of it. The question is how you deal with the anger. And God deals with the anger by, you know, there's a line in Isaiah that says, God looked and saw there was no one to save. 
So he rolled up his sleeves and girded up his loins. I'm using rolling up his sleeves as an example. And got down and dirty and he brought salvation himself. And that's what Christians think the incarnation is about. God getting involved to bring salvation because we can't save ourselves. We're so messed up. Mm, brilliant. Thank you, Richard. And um, I think uh, alongside that God's leading with love and forgiveness, there's this central emphasis of on freedom and true freedom and what that means. Can you tell us a little bit about that and the central significance of God's yeah. deliverance of his people mm -hmm. from bondage in Egypt and their concrete re restoration then to new life? And how does that seminal event then serve as a pattern for understanding salvation in both the Old and the New Testaments? Yeah, so um, when we use the word salvation in the church, we often have a number of misconceptions about it. We often reduce it to one, the beginning of the process of salvation, which in the church is called justification by faith. When you ask for forgiveness and the burden of guilt is lifted, we call that, are you saved? Did you go through that experience? That's a very reductionistic view of salvation. Salvation is a whole process of being transformed. And it's also not primarily or totally an interior process. So at the song at the Red Sea, when, the, when God delivers Israel from the, the armies of Pharaoh, they sing the song and says, the Lord has become our salvation. Because this act of political military deliverance is an act of salvation. God is breaking the bonds that is holding Israel captive. So anytime you are in a situation where God's intent for your life is being blocked and stymied by sin and its effects, whether it's you're, you're in a politically oppressive situation, you're in a war zone, or you're in a situation where there is um, you know, drug abuse, or you're in a, in a dysfunctional family, whatever the situation is, when God delivers you from that, that's salvation. The core salvation of the New Testament, of course, is that God wants us to be intentionally aligned with his purposes. So, of course, we need to accept that we want to be saved. But then salvation is a process of transformation. And it's going to involve interpersonal relationships. It will involve our consumer choices, how we treat the environment. It will involve, you know, a relationship to other people. It will involve how we use social media. All of these are aspects of our salvation in the sense of our becoming transformed, becoming holy. The church has often called that sanctification. That's fine. But it's really in the Bible, salvation is a big word that's for that. It's God liberating us from all that prevents us from being what he intended us to be, which is going to involve some discernment of what did God intend us to be. That's why I've always started with creation theology. What's God's intent for the world of human beings? Mm, fantastic and um whenever i taught in london i taught a little bit of philosophy and we would have done deontology and um deontological ethics and virtue ethics and different things but something that i think comes across in the bible first of all and in your work on the bible is the interplay between these two and the necessity of both so i want to ask you next if i may uh, in what ways then did israel's laws and the wisdom traditions then testify to God's desire to bring this peace and blessings to ordinary human life on earth? Yeah, so I actually would say that there's three ethical theories that intertwine. There's the ontological, that is what ought to be just ought to be. There's the pragmatic, what's the good outcome? And then there's the virtue ethics, how our character is shaped to become virtuous people. And they're all connected in the scriptures. So, you know, the Exodus is God delivering the people from bondage, but then he doesn't just take them to the promised land because bondage deforms you and you need to be transformed. So the Torah, the laws of God, which then are encapsulated in a slightly different way in the wisdom tradition that the wise person discerns God's law and obeys God's law. This is meant to reform and reshape the consciousness of Israel after the deformation of bondage. And we all need this reformation, this transformation into the likeness of God that we might live more holy. But also the, the, the um, statements in the Bible about what, what God intends and how we should live in the various Torah requirements, but also you, know, you come to the New Testament and you come to the Sermon on the Mount or you come to Paul's exhortations to the churches. These are all contextual. I don't think, don't think they're usually deontological. They're not sort of absolute statements as ought to be. So, you know, um, go and do X. The question is, why do we need to do X in that context? And how can we discern from that what God's long-term plan is? Uh, my metaphor is that God really wants us to, I, I didn't really use this in the book, but I use it in other places. God really wants us to travel on the journey, let's say, north. You're going to make that up, right? So um, 
go north. But sometimes as you're traveling the journey, the lay of the land means that there's blockages, there's rocks that have fallen. You have to go around the rocks. And some directives in the Bible are saying, go west or go east. But that's to get around the blocks. Ultimately, God wants you to get north. So I, I, I view a deontology, an uh, absolute art, underneath the, the various regulations, but they're often more contextual to help us move towards that ultimate purpose, which is um, the purpose of interpersonal love and justice in the world. How to get there is complicated. I'm not saying it's simple by any means. No, absolutely. Thank you for that, Richard. And um, I think your work is important. And we mentioned anti right previously and restoring that historical imagination and really wrestling with history. And, and that includes wrestling with the scriptures. And I think that's most important, I must say, especially in this age of uh, everything so imminent, so immediate. Yeah. It's all about mm -hmm. now that context is most important. And um, I want to ask you next, if I may, how we should approach texts that portray God's coming as this, this vivid theophany, uh, often accompanied by a kind of shaking or melting of the world. And uh, how does that serve as a prelude to salvation? And can you share an example or two that you've worked with? Yeah. So I have a chapter in the book, New Heaven and New Earth, on Old Testament judgment theophany, where God comes and the world melts or shakes and there's destruction. And it sounds like it's absolute destruction. And then you hear, and then after that, People, in, people who are left praise the Lord because he's dealt with the evil that's there. And many of these texts which sound like cosmic shaking and destruction are really about the say, judgment on Babylon or the judgment on Eden, the different places in Isaiah and Jeremiah and other places and, and Haggai and so forth. And the New Testament has a similar sort of thing. And I go to the text in a different chapter of all the New Testament texts. So for example, in this, you know, Jesus is talking about the end of the age. The disciples ask, when is this going to happen? And he talks about there's going to be signs and rumors of war. And, and one of the signs is that the, you know, the, the stars will fall from the sky and the sun is going to turn dark and all this kind of stuff. Well, we know that, say, the, the Jewish historian Josephus used similar language to describe the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman armies. Uh, this is symbolic or figurative language that is applied to historical events generally to say, there's something of momentous significance happening here. And in each case, the, the judgment that comes is to bring about the possibility of healing. So a contemporary example might be that you needed to get the Berlin Wall down to bring about a more democratic society um, in Germany. But the coming of the Berlin Wall and, and the leads to also the balkanization <laughs> um, that's going on in the world. And so there are sometimes negative effects of a redemptive move. And I think the judgment theophanies of the Bible just suggest that, that to get from our terribly um, broken situation to a situation of healing is gonna require crisis. And it's not gonna be easy. And in fact, anyone knows who has moved from an individual personal level of crisis to healing, it's never been easy. Why would it be easy on the social and political level either? So that's what I'm thinking of when I'm talking about um, the judgment is primarily for healing and for salvation, but the judgment is real and there is genuine crisis is going to happen. It's not going to be easy. Hmm. I can say a lot more about that, but maybe you want to ask something else. <laughs> I'll build upon that actually and ask you what it means then to suggest the judgment is this kind of inescapable, inescapable reality for those who resist God's will. And why, again, that's vital to human flourishing. And I think that uh, something that might help people to get it is, as a bit of a bridge is a um, Canadian psychologist, Jordan Peterson. And what he talks about, he talks about even whenever you have a standard that serves as a judge upon you. And it's not purely or ultimately negative, it actually helps us to flourish. And I think it's, that's, as you show, there's a great deal more to life than what has become this kind of nihilistic expressive individualism where there's no standards, it's all morally relative. And it's a, uh, David Bentley Hart talks about this drifting of the will from nothing to nothing. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that you're, you know, people that are really interested in Jordan Peterson, the psychologist, and how even a psychologist can help unveil some of these deep truths in the scriptures and um, can see some of the wonderful, I can see some 
complementary emphases in your work. Yes. And somebody else I mentioned to you before, this um, iconographer, Jonathan Pajot, also from Canada, and what he describes in his work in the symbolic world. Would you like to speak any of that intersection, maybe? Yeah, well, let me put it this way. So there's a famous statement that um, man is the measure of all things. Now, that's a statement from the ancient sophists in Greece. Plato thought that was ludicrous. How could man be the measure of all things? That's the way we think today. Now, to go to Jordan Peterson, he's a Jungian. Well, Jung said that when the individual finds their place in the cosmos, it gives great meaning to life. But you have to have a bigger system, something, something beyond yourself. And um, the, 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 the uh, writer today, David Brooks, says similar things in his recent works that you have to have some larger story of meaning that you participate in. Otherwise, your life really has no meaning. So there has to be something beyond yourself. Now, that beyond gives you positive meaning that you participate in a bigger plan. But it also means you're held accountable to a standard that's beyond yourself. We are not the measure of all things. We need to, you know, in some sense, internalize that measure. So it's not just an external thing, you know, clamping down on us. But it's not autonomy either. It's, uh, it's not autonomy. It's not heteronomy coming from the outside. It's, to use Paul Tillich's term, it's theonomy. But I'm not sure I believe what Tillich meant exactly is right, but we need to be congruent between our own sense of purpose and morality and that there is something beyond us that is not just exactly the same as what we believe. We want to comport ourselves in relation to that larger story, that larger meaning. And it's unique in the modern world, um, basically since the Enlightenment, maybe even going back to the Renaissance, that um, you know, going back to Pico della Mirandola's oration on the dignity of man, which he took a Neoplatonic framework and made it modern and said, a human being is an amphibian between all worlds. We can be anything we want to be. We can go down, we can go up, we can become a god if we want. And this has become the, the dominant theme of the modern world. That's highly, highly problematic. It's what led Nietzsche in the parable of the madman to have the madman going around and, and proclaiming the death of God, but nobody could understand it. As he said, y'all kill God. You're the ones who kill God. God meaning the, the larger sense of meaning. I know you have to become gods to be worthy of this act, but you don't understand it yet. This event is still on its way. It hasn't reached us yet. And this is about what, 1860 or so, um, Nietzsche wrote this. Well, it's reached us now. And we know what it means that we are the center of all meaning. And it's absolute nihilism. It's, it's the war of the gods, theomachy. Everybody is fighting everybody else. Everybody asserts their own absolute truth against others. You see, it's interesting that relativism doesn't mean there's no truth. Relativism means my truth is the only truth that's relevant. So it's an interesting kind of twist on that. And the only way to subordinate ourselves to something bigger is humility and repentance and openness to what God has for us. So I think this is a really important point that Peterson is on to. Very important point. Yeah, thank you very much, Dear Richard. And um, I, I see a lot of people critique the Renaissance for that point you made. And it is true, unfortunately, for some people. I was actually just reading today, funny enough, um, James Hankins. He has written about soul craft and state craft in the Renaissance. And he's offered this um, new vision of different emphases alongside that unfortunate right. one, which would have... Um, Brought about this kind of classical and Christian synthesis, which I think is fascinating, and how that plays out, and um, how that can be cultivated through, say, classical education, understanding of logic and grammar and rhetoric. So uh, I just wanted to say that I think that's a, a fascinating and important alternative thesis in um, bringing out the good of the of the Renaissance. He, he works with mm -hmm. the Italian Renaissance, and I think that syncs actually with what you're saying, what you're describing about that a greater vision and how we, we live a life of virtue according with this um, greater context of meaning. And I don't think it's necessarily, at least in the way he frames the issue, um, against what the scripture is saying, but that there is a, a, a balance there. Right, right. That makes sense. Yes. I, I, think, for, I think, for example, that um, I, I really respect a, a comment that I've heard Jordan Peterson make. He said that, you know, when he's asked, do you believe in God? He said, well, what do you mean by believe? What do you mean by God? Right? It's a complicated question. He says, I would like to think that I'm living in a way that God would be pleased with me. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. Um, most of us don't even think that in this contemporary world. But I would like that. I, I may fail, but that's my aspiration. Yes. Mm 
Thank you, Jay Richard. And um, I want to ask you more then about the broad strokes of this holistic vision in the New Testament that you share. And what are some of the features of the New Testament's theology fulfilling the Old Testament of cosmic redemption? And what do you find most captivating there? The thing that got me going with the New Testament was really the proclamation of Jesus in Luke chapter four. Um, in, in this three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you have um, the, the baptism of Jesus by John and the temptation of the wilderness. Then he comes into Galilee and proclaims the kingdom of God. In Matthew and Mark, he says, the kingdom is at hand, repent and believe. I think in Matthew just says repent, um, but it's the same idea. In Luke, he doesn't use kingdom of God language. He gives this narrative um, of Jesus going to the synagogue at Nazareth, reading the scroll from Isaiah 61, and is saying the spirit of the Lord is upon me. I mean, he, he basically takes on himself the role of what the prophet Isaiah in the post-exilic period was challenging his people with. That is, that God is coming to bring about a new era, a new epoch, that is like the fulfillment of the year of Jubilee. Jesus says, this is coming, and there will be sight for the blind and good news for the poor, release for the oppressed. Radical new social order. Now, first century Jew, Jew, Jewish expectation of the messianic age, there was a lot of variety about who the Messiah would be, a human or an angel, one or two, Davidic, priestly, what? a lot of complications. One thing was pretty universal for those expecting the messianic age. When it came, everything in the world would be fixed immediately. And Jesus comes and proclaims the kingdom, but not everything is fixed immediately. He inaugurates a kingdom, but the resurrection of the dead is what's supposed to happen, right? God's going to restore all those who have been persecuted and destroyed by the empires and the world will become perfect again. You know, But Jesus comes and it doesn't become perfect again. He's actually killed by the Roman Empire with some collusion from some of the Jewish leaders. And then he's raised from the dead. I know that's an amazing thing that in the midst of history, one man is raised from the dead. No, resurrection of the dead, that's actually not very important in our worldview. So if you know if you have a neighbor, let's say your neighbor is Bob, and Bob died three weeks ago, and then a few days later, you saw Bob walking around your neighborhood, you say, my goodness, he's been raised from the dead. You go tell your friends over a latte, you know, hey, my, Bob's been raised from the dead. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, man, far out, man, really weird things happen in the world, and you go about your business. But if you have an expectation, I'm using the, the terminology from Wolfhard Pannenberg now, you have a horizon of expectations, that when the world is perfected, there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. And one man is raised of the dead. You know what you say? Oh, crap. It's happening. <laughs> it's happening. By just starting. And the New Testament goes against a traditional Jewish expectation that's all going to happen at once and says, he is the first fruits of the new creation. And in the book of Revelation, Jesus is called the, the bright morning star. Now, that's the star of Venus. And if you see Venus shining with light, it means the sun is reflecting off Venus. But in the early hours of the, the morning, when it's still dark and you see Venus rising, that means the sun, which is below the horizon, is about to dawn. And he's a right morning star because the new age is about to dawn. His resurrection is a foretaste of the coming of the renewal of the world. And so that's the, this holistic vision that I understand, um, beginning with the proclamation of the kingdom, and going right through to the, there be a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Because boy, it doesn't, righteousness is not at home right now. It's an alien in the world, but it's going to be at home in the new creation. Mm, amen. <clears throat> and then, um, just touching upon that then, Richard, what are some of the ways that um, the New Testament shows then that sin and evil will be reversed in line with what you're saying there? And how does that stand in contrast to this kind of absolutized moral relativism as we spoke about before? Hmm. Ask, say a little bit more specifically, what, what are you getting at? That's a very huge question. No, that's true. <laughs> I don't even know how to, to make it more concise. <laughs> right. okay. You know, it's one of those ones I'm not actually entirely sure of myself. So I can't really uh, articulate I mean, I mean, it. Well. <laughs> I can go this way. Say that you go within the, 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 the writings of the New Testament and you have a lot of exhortation to the church and the Pauline epistles, for example, about living a different way of life. Do not live as the Gentiles. Live, live in wisdom, live in the light, um, live as transformed people. So there's a, an emphasis on transformation of who we are, our identity, and our, our relationships that we live in a different way. We do not simply absorb the ways of the world. 
you know, Paul famously says in Romans 12, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's going to be you know, embodied in your, your um, life as a living sacrifice, present your body as a living sacrifice. Or it can then jump to the, new to the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation, where John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And the old had passed away, and it's going to be new. And in this new world, the curse is lifted from the earth, for reference to Genesis 3.17, when the earth is cursed through human sin. There'll be a transformation of reality, and the righteous will be in the new Jerusalem, which is an interesting metaphor, because the new Jerusalem is the righteous, but it's also a city. It's a mixed metaphor, saying that God wants to redeem people in their urban environments as social cultural beings, and the glory of the kings and the glory of the nations shall be brought into the new Jerusalem, so it's not an obliteration of all we've done in history. It takes the best of history and keeps it. And then we are open to new transformation as the glory of God is meant to then fill the earth as it filled the tabernacle of the temple in, in ancient times. So this is a vision that goes from the moral transformation of God's people through to the transformation of the cosmos. And of course, of course, in a contemporary secular enlightenment age, look, I, I've... I have a philosophy degree, an MA in philosophy. I, I have been grazed by um, doubt, uncertainty, non-being. I understand what Heidegger was talking about in this. I don't believe any of this in a naive, simplistic way. I believe this in what Ricoeur called a second naivete. How will this ever happen? How will the world get transformed? You look at the present situation in the world, and you despair sometimes. But we are people of hope because we believe in a narrative a non-negotiable story of God's unwavering love for the world. So committed he came into history to give himself on the cross, to be destroyed for us, to take that poison out of the world and transmute it into redemption. That's the theory of the atonement. It's not a theory. Nobody can explain that. But I believe that in the depths of my being, when everything else is taken away, when everything I believe is ripped to shreds, what do I stand on? Jesus is the love of God to me. And because of that, I believe that there's going to be a, a radical transformation coming. And the question is not, can I predict that in any way? The question is, do I want to be a part of that? Hell yes. I want to embrace that and live that in my life. As fallibly as I do, I understand, but I still want that. Amen. And um, I think uh, going off that there then, Richard, what are some of the main problem texts that people do throw up for a holistic eschatology? And how do we know that they are actually based on misreading the scriptures then? Yeah, yeah. So, well, so there, there are two ways to get at that. The first way is actually pretty simple. It's this, so at the age of 20, when I began, when I was an undergraduate working on this whole question of holistic eschatology, I did a Bible study in my church in Kingston, Jamaica. And I, in my Bible study, I said, okay, we're going to be studying the subject of the coming of Christ and the redemption of the world. Um, I want you to come back next week and bring all the passages in the New Testament that say that God will destroy this world and take us to heaven. And people would bring various passages. We'd look at it together and we'd say, oh yeah, it doesn't actually say that. I just assumed it said that by the lens I was using. We'd go through multiple passages and I actually told people, I would actually pay you money if you can find me any passage that says, the final destiny of those who are righteous will be a material heaven. They couldn't find any because there are none. So that, that's the first um, line of approach. You can't find any clear statement that we will transcend the earthly realm to a heavenly realm as our final destiny, as salvation. But then you have other texts which seem to suggest that between death and resurrection, we'll exist in a disembodied state. And there are six of those texts, and I go through them all in the New Testament. And many people don't really distinguish between the final destiny of being heaven and the intermediate state being heaven, both being interpreted as a non-material realm where you are a spirit or a soul or something like that. Um, and so we look at those texts. One of them is very interesting. It's Paul in 2 Corinthians, where he's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He, he speaks about the resurrection and wanting to, to, to join in the resurrection, but then he goes on to say, that to be present in the body is to be absent from the Lord. And he'd prefer to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. And that's taken to mean that Paul has these three realms, the present earthly life where you're in the body, 
but God's somehow you're absent from God, whatever that might mean. The future resurrection when you're present with, with, with God, and then the intermediate state where you're present with, with God or present with Christ, but you don't have a body. But if you go back to the chapter four of Second Corinthians, and the chapter divisions are our you know, relatively recent distinctions. There are no chapter divisions in the epistle to the Second Corinthians. Paul says that he trusts that despite all the problems of this life, God will bring his hearers, the church in Corinth, together with him into the presence of Christ in a resurrected state. He actually says that in chapter 4, verse 14. So when you get to him saying, I don't want to be in this mortal dying body, I want to be present with God and with Christ. If you read it in the context of chapter 4, he's saying in a resurrected state, so the only way to be present with God after death is in the resurrection. In between, to use the language of both Old Testament and Paul, you sleep. That just means you aren't aware of what happens. But there are lots of texts like that I get into. And I actually think those intermediate state texts are the least interesting ones. Because even if you could say there are six passages in the New Testament that says you will exist in a disembodied state between death and resurrection, suppose you could find, you could really believe that. It says that's not really the Christian hope. The Christian hope is a new creation. And that's also the Jewish hope. Jews and Christians are together on this. We have some differences on how you get there, but we're together on this point, basically. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Richard. And then I think the problem text of problem texts in many cases seems to be the book of Revelation and the way people yeah. misinterpret that. And um, could you maybe tell us about some of the misconceptions regarding that book and how uh, it refers to the, there will be no sea and so on, and people sort of yeah, yeah. visualize that liter as li meaning literally and yeah. uh, what it's actually getting at in some of those instances then? So the book of Revelation is in the genre of apocalyptic. Now, in the modern world, when we use the word apocalyptic, we mean something like a tremendously catastrophic event. It's an apocalyptic event. But apocalyptic doesn't mean that as a genre. It just means a revelation of the true meaning of history, because apocalypsis means unveiling or revelation. And the first apocalyptic books was probably Daniel. And then there are many intertestamental books of Jewish and Christian writings that are um, apocalyptic, apocalyptic writings. And all of these use weird symbolic language to describe events that would have been relevant to the hearer of the book. And so the, the idea that there will be no more sea, first you have to understand what does the sea symbolize in the Jewish tradition. And there are at least two things that are going on there. In the Old Testament, which draws on the ancient Near East, the sea is a metaphor for chaos. You know, to be cast into a storm, you're lost. But to be on dry land, it's solid, you're on terra firma. And so the sea is a metaphor for it, the chaos of the world, including the sin of the world. In some cases, and not always that way, symbols can be used in more than one way. In the book of Daniel, you have beasts arising from the sea, which you also have in the book of, of Revelation. So to say the sea is no more does not mean, oh, darn, I can't go to the ocean for a swim, because I love the ocean, I'll tell you, I love walking on the beach. It's that the forces of chaos will be eradicated from the new creation. It's symbolic. And indeed, as you read earlier in the book of Revelation, before the reference in the last two chapters, with the sea being gone, you have the notion that the, all the merchants of the earth who are colluding with the Roman Empire to control trade and oppress people, it's the sea routes that allow them that. So the sea will be no more also means there'll be no more oppression at the economic level in the new creation. These are symbolic terms. You have to always understand what the symbols are getting at to, to ask them the question, what does it mean for us today? And we tend to read the book of Revelation, at least I'd say, especially in the past hundred years in, in, in the West, as if there was a video camera there recording it. And that's what it would really look like. So, you know, uh, Jesus in the book of Revelation and, and the spirit of God, they have seven eyes, right? Figure that how that looks like. That's just weird. But that's <laughs> symbolic, right? <laughs> the whole thing is symbolic. So what's the symbols speak of? Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Richard. And um, then how did Christ himself respond to the danger of being misunderstood in his own time? And why is that important? How does he respond to the danger of being misunderstood? Well, um, I guess at some times he tries to clarify. <laughs> what the misunderstanding is. Other times he condemns people for not understanding because misunderstanding, and here I'm drawing on the wisdom literature, like the book of Proverbs, misunderstanding is not a simple logical error. 
It is often a moral fault that we do not open ourselves to understand, but we assume we already know the truth. So when we hear something that seems to contradict, we just dismiss it. And that's the way we misunderstand. And people would leave Jesus because it was too hard. The teachings were too hard. It didn't fit their preconception of what it meant to follow the Messiah. But that's the case in the history of the world. So I, I think that the book of Proverbs suggests that there's a moral dimension to wisdom and understanding and knowledge. So many times in the book of Proverbs, you have the exhortations, get knowledge, seek it with all your heart, bind it to you. Don't give up on wisdom. Go for it. You know, it's without effort, you're not going to understand. And effort involves a stance of openness and humility. It doesn't mean you don't believe anything, but it means you're willing to be transformed. Wonderful. Thank you, Richard. And um, another element of your work that I find most convicting and convincing is the radical nature of it. And you talk about this challenge of the kingdom. And I've spoken with, with people like Sani Harwas and um, Bishop Will Milliman, and they have spent so much time on the radical, distinct nature of Christianity. And uh, you, you describe this a little bit. What are some of the, the ways then that the church can live boldly yet humanely as this alternative community in the bro this broken world, as you're suggesting? I just want to make a little bit of a dissent from the, the Harwas Willeman point of view. I, I respect them greatly. And I, I've actually, Harwas spoke at one of the anniversaries of my grad school, and I was there and it was an interesting talk. Um, but he tends to overdo the challenge. So, you know, the ministry of the church is to use traditional classical language to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Well, he likes to just afflict the comfort. <laughs> he even afflict the afflicted. That's the problem. And I want to say that the gospel brings hope and healing to those in difficult circumstances, but also calls us to something higher and challenges us beyond our comfort zone. So it's a bit of both. And you could say, well, the church today needs X, Y, Z, but the church is a complicated bunch of people. You have elite people with all kinds of education and privilege. You have people who are oppressed and down in the dumps and who are... Um, at the bottom of the, the social heap, you have people in all kinds of situations. And so the, the challenge cannot simply be one universal challenge to everybody. Ministry involves discerning what people actually need at any particular point in their journey and addressing their actual needs. That's how I start answering your question. But let me see if you want to push me a little further now. No, that's great. I, I agree, actually, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love and, Stanley Harwell. You know, I'd say that. Yeah. No, that's great. And um, can you tell us a little more about some of the hopeful recent signs of recovery of this more holistic uh, understanding in yeah. academia and in the church then across those social strata and everything? Yeah. So I started working on this topic of holistic eschatology in the 70s, and there was very little written by people who were taking it seriously. But um, especially since the 80s and 90s, um, more and more academics and now, and now a lot of pastors embrace the vision that God wants to restore the world, not destroy the world and take us to heaven. So I had this very interest, interesting experience when I teach courses, when this becomes, this is a part of the courses I teach, right? I'll have one student who will say, oh, oh yeah, the God's gonna redeem the world. We're not going to heaven, it's a new heaven, a new earth. We all know that, we, he shouldn't know a church. We've been teaching that for 20 years. You have another person saying, what? What? I never heard this before. So you got the two kinds of people. Yep. It depends, you know, how the academic research on this topic has come down to us. But a really interesting example of how in academia, among biblical scholars and theologians, there's hardly anybody left. There are a few people. Um, God bless them. Some of them are my friends. <laughs> but, but hardly anybody anymore thinks, certainly no biblical scholars I know, think, that the final destiny of creation is God's going to obliterate the world. He's going to burn and take us to heaven. There's a notion that we're going to have a new heaven and new earth. So coming out in about four months, there's a book from Zondervan called Four Views on Heaven, where I'm writing a view on the renewed earth. And that none of the other three views believe that God's going to destroy the earth and take us to heaven. They all agree, but they have differences of nuance of how we work that out theologically. So, you know, even Peter Kreeft, who was a classical Thomist, believes in a new heaven and a new earth. <laughs> you know, uh, so even the person who they tried to get to, to give an argument that heaven is the final destiny said, well, it's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. How the details are a little different from what I would put in there. But so at the academic level, 
biblical scholars and most theologians will agree that there's going to be a redemption of the world and an obliteration of the world, but it hasn't quite reached all parts of the church. Now, here's where I'm going to pick up on Harwas and say what's true about Harwas, right? There are certain segments of the church, including the academics and pastors, who have accepted that God wants to redeem this world. And there is an important dimension of our action in the world that makes a difference. But who have taken this in, I would say, a too aggressive, autonomous way. So they're, they have identified, I'm, I'm speaking now as somebody who lives in the United States of America, but there's probably versions of this in different countries. But there are many people who say, yes, God redeemed the world. But they tend to identify this vision with a kind of American nationalism. And so to God, the world is the world that we know and love. But they don't really speak as if God cares about the whole world, all the nations, all the peoples, all the social status in the world. It's people like us. And so they imbibe an us-them form of tribalism and mix it with a holistic salvation. So yes, God wants to redeem us. Isn't that great? Let's take America back again for God. Oh, that's just BS. God wants to redeem the world, people from all nations and languages and so on. And your nationalism is relativized. It doesn't mean it's that your nationality is obliterated. I celebrate that I'm a Jamaican, but I also immigrated to Canada and Canada shaped me and now I'm in America and I put my roots down here and I love these nations. But to love a nation is not the same thing as to absolutize a nation. And so there is a challenge that when you mix holistic eschatology with a narrow form of identity politics, you're actually distorting the gospel probably worse than if you just stuck with an otherworldly escape to heaven. That probably is better because you might treat your neighbor better that way. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Richard. And um, there's a song I always come back to when I hear stuff like that by Bob Dylan um, with God on our side and how all these different people through history have had God on their side. It's one of my yeah. favorite songs. <laughs> and uh, I want to ask you next then, Richard, if I may, is there anything that you wish you had included in the book looking back now or some positive positive development since you wrote the book that you are excited about? The New Heaven and New Earth book you're talking about. Yeah. So my, my final chapter, which is really chapter 13, but they call it an appendix because they don't like the number 13. It's a bad lucky number, right? <laughs> That's what I think is going on. <laughs> it's a history of eschatology, how we lost the vision of a new creation and began to regain it. And since writing that, I found so many more sources over the past 50 years or so, even before that, of people regaining a vision of new creation. It's much broader and wider than I'd even imagined. And maybe I was even skeptical about some of the, the earlier, um, late, the late patristic and early medieval stuff. Maybe there's more of it there too, but it's not dominant. So I, I'm not a historian and that was a historical chapter. I had to depend on what many other people had written. So maybe there's more I could have said about that. And of course, there's a lot I could have added to the book. Um, one of the reviewers said that the book could read almost like a biblical theology, except it doesn't really cover everything. And one of the critiques I've got is, you focus so much on holistic salvation. What about the individual that needs to be changed? Well, of course, I believe that. I've talked to that with you, but you can't put everything in a book. And I'm addressing particular issues in the book. I'm not trying to be comprehensive. But it actually critiqued as if I don't believe the individual needs to be changed, which just is foolishness. <laughs> I mean, people are reading through a particular lens, and they're not open to learning. They're, anyway, I won't get into that. Right here. No, is that guy who hate me is a brother in Christ, but I just disagree with him on that kind of stuff. No, good. It's healthy. Thank you, Richard. And um, I want to ask you about your current and future work now then. And um, can you tell us a little bit about your most um, exciting new book, the Abraham's Silence, The Binding of Isaac, The Suffering of Job, and How to Talk Back to God, good title too. <laughs> yeah. So um, for, for, when I mentioned at the beginning of our interview that one of my three moments that transformed me was going through a time of darkness and I lost my way and couldn't figure out what the goodness of God is all about. And I, re I recovered the lament psalms and was praying through them and recovered a deep relationship to God as a result of that. That's led me to study the motif in the Bible of prayer, especially in the Old Testament, but it's in the New as well, that God desires, this is my phrasing, God desires a vigorous dialogue partner. God wants us to, to, to let me quote one of my um, professors, um, Cal Sierva, who wrote a book called Take Hold of God and Pull, 
I like that. Hang on to God. I'm not going to let go till I get a blessing. So the grappling with God, like Jacob at the Jabbok at night with a man in the darkness, you know, probably thrashing about in the mud. That's what prayer can be like. And you have the lament psalms, 50 psalms approximately, grapple with God and question God and ask for help. And then you have the prophetic tradition starting with Moses who challenges God. You can't destroy Israel. And God says, okay, whatever you say, I'll go do what you say, Moses. And, and it happens multiple times in the Mosaic narratives. And then the prophets challenge God. They bring the word of God to the people and say, judgment is coming. They turn to God and say, hold off, God. Don't bring judgment yet. Give them a chance to repent. So much so God tells Jeremiah three times, stop praying for these people because they're not changing. I've got to bring judgment. But the intercession of a righteous person means something with God. And then the book of Job. So I have a whole section in the book of Job here, right? Um, I have two chapters taking you from chapter one to chapter 42 of Job, a narrative exposition of what's going on from the point of view of what is appropriate speech in a time of suffering. And the book of Job concludes that appropriate speech is to speak your mind honestly to God. And God at the end validates Job's speech and critiques his friends who try to explain why God is causing Job's suffering. God says, I don't want you to explain it, but he talked back to me at a big mouth, like Leviathan who breathes fire. And this, this is my model for Job. Job, be like Leviathan. Don't shut up. And God affirms Job's speech. Now, I discovered that there were many intertextual connections between the book of Job and Abraham's story, especially Genesis 22. So what this has all led to is my grappling for, I don't know, for 30 years with Genesis 22. God tells Abraham, take your son, your only one whom you love, Isaac, and present him as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show you. Now, if God told me to do that, if I really heard a voice from heaven or an internal voice, and I, I, I first say, who the heck is this? <laughs> one of my students put it, I would say, get thee behind me, Satan. Or if I suddenly realize this really is God, I would say, God, what are you asking? I must kill my son to prove my faithfulness to you. Are you crazy? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to challenge God. The same way Moses challenged God. The psalmist challenged God. Job challenges God. But Abraham in silence goes to do it. And so I rethink the meaning of, the, of Genesis 22, known as the akedah, the binding. That's what the Hebrew word for binding is. And he binds Isaac. And I rethink this in terms of not only the overall pattern of prayer in the Bible, I rethink it by rereading the Abraham story as a whole and show you that it cannot mean what we think it means. And then you say, but the angel from heaven validates Abraham that he was doing what was right. And I go through the angel speeches and I show that if you don't assume the angel is validating Abraham, everything the angel says could be read as a critique of Abraham. And so at, at, from a biblical canonical point of view, prayer in the, in the Bible, the Abraham story, and then the angel speeches, I try to show that Abraham did not give the optimal response to God. The optimal response would have been to pray and address God and challenge God. And he would have learned, I think, of God's mercy, because I think God's response would have been, you're right, you understand me. I wanted you to learn that I was a God of compassion and mercy. Now you understand, you don't have to kill him. Of course not. I wanted you to get that. The second optimal thing would be Abraham could be silent, but he would be searching for an alternative sacrifice. I mean, he tells Isaac, right? Isaac says to him, Father, where, where you know, here's the fire and the knife, um, but, but, or, or the fire and the wood, I think, for the offering, but where is the sheep for the offering? He says, God will provide the sheep. But he goes up the mountain, he never looks for a sheep. It's only after he, the angel says, don't kill the boy, he looks around and finds there's a ram caught in a thicket. He never actually looked. So if he had looked for an alternative sacrifice, maybe that would be a, you know, um, praying to God, that's, that's an A plus in that exam he passed. Um, looking for a sacrifice, that's a B. Well, he didn't do either. Did he pass or fail that test? I don't know, but he never learned what God wanted to teach him. And I hope that we would learn from scripture that God desires vigorous dialogue partners. So that's what the book's about. No, oh, brilliant. I must look forward to it. And um, I would maybe love to speak with you about it in the future if you're up for it, uh, Richard. And, We'd love to. Uh, yeah, fantastic. And uh, I want to ask you, 
in line with that then um two things spring to mind uh, if i may so um the first one would be is there a tie then with what's happening there with abraham and what christ later says on the cross at the end my god my god why have thou forsaken me and um how do those two relate if that's a right well he so I actually have a little section. It's not a whole unit or a chapter, but within the material in the book, I go to the New Testament and show analogies to the old. So Christ prays a lament psalm, which opens with, imagine you open a prayer with, oh, not, oh Lord, we thank you for all your good gifts to us. And you just say, where have you abandoned me? <laughs> so you start, right? That means you're desperate. And he prays that prayer on the cross. So he participates in lament. In the Garden of Gethsemane, on the way to the cross, he prays that God would take this cup from him. Nevertheless, he submits to God's will, which is appropriate. Both boldness and submission are the two dialectical aspects of a general relation to God. And he teaches us to pray the Lord's Prayer. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. And all this. So are you going to, why are you telling God to make his kingdom come? Doesn't he know his kingdom should come? You're holding God to what he's already promised. That's what prayer really is. God promised his presence. So you say, why have you abandoned me? God promises kingdom. So you say, may your kingdom come because I don't see it around me right now. Give us this day this daily bread. Don't you trust God to give you daily bread? God wants us to ask for what he's already promised. Let's take the two parables on prayer Jesus taught. The friend at midnight. So somebody comes to your house and you don't have any food for them. You go to the neighbor's house, you knock and wake him up at midnight and say, I need some food to feed my friend. Go away, you're bothering me. Keep knocking till they give you bread. That's what intercessory prayer is about, says Jesus. And the, the importunate widow who goes to the unjust judge and asks for her case to be judged righteously. The judge said, go away. You're not important to me. I got well-paying people who pay me to render good judgment. You're a poor person. She badges him to me. He says, all right, I'll give you justice. Just leave me alone. And that's what petitionary prayer is. So the Bible assumes in both testaments that God wants to, us to grapple with him. And I think Jesus himself in his teachings and in his life, models that. So that's what's going on, I think, on the cross. He's modeling that. Fantastic. Thank you, Richard. And um, the second thing that came to my mind there, I wanted to ask you about, I've asked so many people about this recently because I'm so obsessed with Terrence okay. Malick, the filmmaker, and his movies and how they convey these deep truths. Um, are you familiar with Malick's work and how he uses the um, the book of Job, for example, in yeah. The Tree of Life? Life. which I think is fascinating and then a hidden life I think is an even better film personally uh, which focuses on um, the conscientious, conscientious objector um, he's not a Catholic saint um, what is his name escape me in Austria um, against the I, didn't, I only view the tree of life I didn't view the second one I gotta say I found it pretty boring oh, really? I, need, I need a narrative and that was a very non-narrative type of thing so I, I saw that the use of Job and so on but you know what struck me more was there a lot of quotations from the imitation of Christ? I, and I don't know if you noticed that, but I, I read the imitation of Christ as an example of fleeing earth to heaven. And I, a lot of that was intertwined in it. And I didn't find it very helpful personally. I know other people love the movie, so I'm not going to criticize it for that. It wasn't one that resonated with me. No, that's fair enough. That's interesting. I want, I'd be interested to hear what you would think of A Hidden Life then, which I think is much better. I, I, like, maybe I, should, I didn't watch it because I didn't really get much out of the first one. Well, Malik went yeah, back to um, Malik went back to uh, script for a hidden life, actually. So I think it, that more narrative approach would really. Yeah, yeah. And, and the reviews I saw of it made me think it was better, but I just haven't watched it yet. Yes. Oh, fantastic! Thank you so much for joining me today, Richard. And um, just, just to close up, if I may, uh, where can viewers or listeners then find out more about you and your work? How can they find out? Um, I have a blog post um, website. It's called Creation to Eschaton. It's uh, basically jrichardmiddleton.com. Um, I, I try to post on a regular basis. I, I'm a little bit behind right now because I'm full of teaching and grading and stuff. Like that. I'm doing a lot of uh, schoolwork, uh, but I need to do some more posting. Uh, you can also find me pretty easily on uh, Facebook and Twitter if you're interested. Um, that's, what, that's what I would say. Um, I, I don't have too much more besides that right now. Uh, thank you so much for oh, 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 you, you can find okay I, I, so on my website you can find links to most of the articles i've ever written as pdfs you can go there and find them if you want to read further fantastic thank you again richard and god bless you thank you so much Marcus. I'm
Nobody can stop me. Ooh, I'm going there.